Good afternoon. I'm Canon Tricia Hillis and it is a tremendous pleasure to welcome you to St Paul's and especially to this Sunday Forum. And of course a special welcome to Dr Eve Poole who's our speaker this afternoon. Eve's written that the person of a theologian is pertinent in the matter of public theology. So let me explain that she herself was raised as a cradled Christian in the Scottish Episcopal Church. She studied theology at Durham and acquired an MBA at Edinburgh and then a PhD from Cambridge in capitalism and theology. She's taught at the Ashridge Business School with a particular focus on leadership, learning, emotional intelligence, ethics and good change management. Working for Deloitte Consulting in the financial services industry, she's had a whole range of clients from Tesco's to the Foreign Office to the Royal Shakespeare Company. She developed an amazing idea called leadership, leader smithing, leadership smithing. Thanks, thanks for that. <laughs> which is a really um, crucial movement, which is looking at enabling leaders to think about leadership as a craft. She now exercises very senior leadership herself as the third, third Church Estates Commissioner, working alongside Loretta Mingella and Dame Caroline Smel Spellman in managing the C of E's central assets. She's the author of a number of books, but will speak to us today about her latest book, Buying God, Church, Consumerism and Theology, in which she'll draw our attention to our common addiction to growth, novelty and accumulation. She asserts that Christianity is well equipped to lead the response to this alluring appeal of consumerism. My husband, who is in the room, has often referred to me as the retailer's and marketer's dream. <laughs> it's a view I might well refute, but I am and always will be a consumer. So I'm here this afternoon in the hope of learning how I might be a better, more informed, more mindful and transformed consumer one that's mindful of the counsel of theological reflection and the gaze of God. So if you're here with similar questions, I do really believe that we're in for a, a, a real treat. And we might just leave with our thinking and our living a little disturbed by the spirit. Because I've read the book, I'm really looking forward to this. Eve in a moment is going to speak for about 40 minutes, then we'll have time for questions and answers, but we will finish promptly at two o'clock. Eve, before you begin, here is my credit card, <laughs> my, my debit card, my, my latest pay slip, the phone that has my diary and all personal commitments. <laughs> And my two li latest late night internet browsing <laughs> purchases. Anything bought after midnight is always dangerous. Book tape for repairing my Bible. And bunting, which I took to Greenbelt in the hope of looking homespun. <laughs> but the reality is they were bought from Amazon. <laughs> Would you please join me in welcoming Dr. Eve Paul. Thank you, Trisha. And we'll explain why this is all material as we go through. Um, I want to start by introducing you to this thing. Some of you may, who have read the Church Times or been at Greenbelt, know what this thing is. Does anybody want to tell the rest of us what it is? Beloved of six-year-old girls, it is a punicorn. So um, everyone is very keen on emojis. Children love emojis. There is a particularly popular emoji of poo. <coughs> of course, kids love poo as well, don't they? Uh, kids also love unicorns. And they love toys that you can attach to your school bag and collect. This also comes in a plastic egg that you can smash. 
So it is retail gold. You've got this combination of everything that will send kids absolutely bananas. So when I was in Whitby recently on a family holiday with my six-year-old twins, their grandparents had given them some holiday money and I'd promised them an Ian Blyton-style idyll of fish and chips every day and rock pooling and all that kind of thing. So we took their money to the local toy master and I sat back waiting for them to buy, you know, I don't know, a kite or a crabbing bucket or, you know, maybe cards or something to play with. But no, they bought punicorns. And that's when I knew I was really toast on this consumerism thing. So how on earth do we fight that? I mean, it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous that you pay five pounds for this cuddly punicorn. So we're really up against quite an incredible machine that will turn these children into these buying machines for things that, that really have no purpose of any sort, apart from as a way of establishing yet more hierarchy in the playground. So I want to talk to you today about um, consumerism, what I think God might think about it, and um, err on the side of the practical, because I imagine most of us are here because we feel uneasy and nervous about just how much of consumerism is around and infecting us all day. And as we just relentlessly keep buying stuff, it's very hard to figure out how would we do that better or differently? How, how can we turn this enormous tide? So those of you who were in the Eucharist this morning will have heard read from James um, this really nice line. Be doers of the word and not merely hearers who deceive themselves. So I want to talk much more about doing today than anything else. And I want to do this because of the theological journey that I went on to try and understand how do we do something better about consumerism. So if I may do just a little bit of biography to explain the journey. Um, I worked for Deloitte, as you've heard, after I had worked as a graduate for the church commissioners. So I'd done a bit of God and a bit of Mammon, and I was a bit puzzled about why they weren't better pals and learning from each other in a constructive way. Um, and I felt uneasy about capitalism as a whole because it felt precarious to me. This was way before the crash, actually. So I decided the only way you can defeat such an enormous edifice as capitalism is by understanding the worldview that created it. So luckily I have a theology degree and in the 1700s when Adam Smith was creating the wealth of nations, the worldview that was prevalent in that time um, across most of the West was um, a Judeo-Christian worldview. So I thought if I can get inside theology and look at it as a lens, look at capitalism through that, I might be able to spot where the rot has set in. So my doctorate was about that, theology and capitalism, and the first few books were trying to unpack that to say where is capitalism broken and how do we fix it before it's too late? And of course, if capitalism is the hardware, consumerism is the software. And what's happened nowadays with mobile phones and smartphones is that consumerism has just rocketed ahead because every ding, every ping, every like, every status update is telling you what your peer group are choosing um, and what they're consuming. And the idea behind that is to make you feel somehow inferior or unworthy. And you only have to sit through so many sermons about the prodigal son to realise that it is very normal to be jealous of other people and the labourers in the vineyard think you should have got paid more. Um, and it is part of our human condition, um, as we heard in the sermon this morning, to be avaricious. So um, consumerism is a very mighty narrative that um, is, is designed to try and make us keep satisfying our longings. And I want to just talk to you a little bit about why I think that's misbegotten and how we fight back. So Rowan Williams is rather brilliant about this. Um, he talks about, we just need to grow up. He says we have this idea that there are a few sort of holes in our personality, a few flaws, the things that are kind of unfinished. Um, and if we just fix those, we'll, we'll, be, we'll be sorted. Um, and of course, cue the marketeers who say, well, the way you fix that is you buy some Nike trainers, you upgrade your phone and you buy that really smart scarf. Um, so what he says we are doing is desiring the end of desire, that we want to be finished and complete. And again, he gets that, but he says, if we understand what God did in creating us, God created us to be unfinished and to yearn and to find no satisfaction until we find our end in God. So it is the human condition to keep yearning. Um, and the problem is we're being distracted by people at the side of the road who will try and sell us things and distract us into thinking those will fix us somehow. 
Um, Thomas Traherne talks a lot about this. Um, the, the former Bishop of Oxford, the retired, I should say, Bishop of Oxford, um, Harry's, was very hot on this about um, desire being normal and that we should embrace it rather than retreat from it. Uh, it's just what do we desire and why, and what are we doing with that desire? So if you think about capitalism and consumerism as a narrative, they're constantly trying to promise us satisfaction. But if you think about what the necessary conditions for consumerism are, it, you have to think something is novel to want it, because you've got everything else, don't you? So something has to be new, and then you get it, and that's supposed to be the thing that fixes you and makes you finally happy. And then, of course, what do they do? They produce another new thing, because your thing has become old because you've bought it. So we're on this hamster wheel where we are doomed never to be satisfied because of the logistics of the market. There's no point in selling you an iPhone that will last forever. So it is supposed to be obsolete in a few years' time so that shareholder value will be on it. And I've written separately about that because that's one of the logics underneath the market that is a problem. So noticing that, noticing that actually we cannot be satisfied is really the first step and to notice that the market can never satisfy us is really important. The only thing that can satisfy us is God. And that's why theology and Christianity and any religion really is our best defence, because they already tell us that, um, and they already provide us with an idea of what good looks like and where our end is. So another really brilliant theologian, um, who's been very influential in my thinking on this is Peter Sedgwick, who ran the Landau Theological College for a while. And um, what was brilliant about his work on capitalism in particular, and looking at consumerism, was to say when you boil it down, all this relentless quest for newness and acceptability and new stuff and cool things and being better than the neighbours or better than the people at work or better than whatever it might be, is if you boil that down, it's a, it's a search for self-identity. And the marketeers know this because in the olden days they would just sell you a product by describing its benefits. They'd say it's terribly glossy and beautiful and square and it works. Now what they do is they have David Beckham hold the product up and say, you'll be as sexy and amazing and famous as me if you have this product. So the marketeers know that this is about what we feel about where we are socially and who we want to be part of. And branding is about giving us neighbourhoods and communities to join where we can be a sort of Apple person or we can be a kind of Starbucks person or we can be a kind of Nike person. And they're inviting us to join tribes where we feel other cool people hang out, so we therefore must be cool. And of course the churches have been doing this for a lot longer than the brands have and maybe we've just forgotten the virtue in that and that we should be doing that a lot more. But if, re if this really is about self-identity and people feeling lost, then we can offer them a home. We already do to thousands and millions of people globally and we maybe just need to do that a bit more boldly. So let's wind back a little bit and talk a big picture and a small picture thing about how we might do that. Um, I'm a very arrogant theologian um, because I like ordering things and I imagine that um, I can subdue everything under my feet in that sort of really ghastly business school sort of a way. So when I went to do my um, doctorate, I was struggling to tame theology because there's been thousands of years of it, right? And you can't really read all of it, particularly because most of it's not written in English, um, which I was very vexed by because I like being an expert. So I thought, well, what I need to do is um, find a scheme to explain all of theology ever. Um, and obviously I'm not that bright or learned, so I thought well, what I need to do is um, go off to a monastery for five weeks and kind of get in the vibe. So um, it was a bit of a disaster for an extrovert because it was a, a silent order. And um, <laughs> I, I had to just damn well sit there and read these books. There was nothing else to be done. Um, so I sat there and read all these books and uh, sat with my post-it notes and my pens and tried to figure out what is theology, what does it do? Um, so it was a bit like sort of lurking in the bushes with your binoculars watching species and trying to figure out those have got stripes, those have got claws, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, and there's been a fashion for these things called typologies, where you say some theology is like this and some theology is like that. So um, with my big sticks and big pens, I created a, a sort of grid, um, which is actually in this book, of all theology ever. Um, and I decided that if you look at theology... Um, Generally, it's either theology which is trying to explain what we believe and why, which is kind of our worldview as believers of a particular tradition, 
Or it's spending quite a lot of time puzzling about how we ought to do that, really. Is it, is it OK to use that language and should we use this sort of language and on which day should we do it and, you know, the, the kind of etiquette of it. Um, so I decided that there was no theology I had found that wasn't either worldview theology or etiquette theology. So that was my first big slash of the world of theology. And then I noticed that the way theology behaves is either it is addressed to people who share that worldview, so fellow Christians in the church, or it is more globally addressed in the public square to people who may share your views but may not. They may have no faith, they may have different faith, but they certainly wouldn't necessarily buy into your particular version of events. And again, that's quite a broad category, but I noticed that there was either theology that was primarily in the family, sort of church theology, or there was this sort of theology which was more um, out in the marketplace to the world. So um, that gave me this lovely sort of approved Harvard Business Review two by two matrix, um, where you have worldview and church theology, which I've called preaching to the converted, and we do that a lot. We have a lot of liturgy and hymns and songs and stained glass windows and buildings and huge numbers and volumes and volumes of books that explain to us, the faithful, how to do it a bit better and to re-explain stuff we might have forgotten from the past. Then there is um, a sort um, that Rowan Williams taught was sort of helicopter theology, um, which I've called here sharpening our pencils, which is that sort of etiquette theology that, we, again, we talk within the family. We sort of say, when I said God, did I say that right? And should I have said a different word like Yahweh or you know, Jehovah? Or how do they all fit together and which is the correct term? And you know, all that sort of puzzling over how we behave as theologians. So that's the sharpening the pencil. Then moving round, our sort of behavioural how do we do theology stuff we do quite a lot of that in the public square because we spend a lot of time in universities where a lot of theologians hanging out, talking in theory about how we might pluck up the courage to talk in the public square about these things. Um, and there's a lot of work written about, on the off chance we might meet somebody that doesn't share our views, what, what might we, how might we behave? So I've, Jeffrey Stout's brilliant on this. He calls this clearing your throat. We do a lot of clearing of our throats, theologically speaking. Um, and when I did my doctorate, there was a massive gap in this bottom bit, which you may remember is, is us explaining about our beliefs to people who do not share those beliefs. Because what we have tended to do in that square is that sort of British or abroad thing, is uh, we just sort of speak a bit more slowly and clearly and more loudly, and hopefully they will eventually get it. Um, and of course that doesn't really work if you're speaking to people who think you're barking mad um, so actually when you cross that line from speaking to people within the family to speaking to people out in the world you need to observe that you're now entering a world where the ontology is different and if you just use the same words people will just end up thinking that you're not really respecting them enough to try and understand what their worldview is so there was an awful lot of thinking about how theoretically we might have those conversations, but I was finding it hard to find anything going on where we were actually doing it. Um, I mean, there was a bit of House of Lords and a bit of this, that and the other way. You actually see the church in the public square. Um, but again, some of that was a bit sort of British or abroad rather than anything different. And David Ford is very interested in mood in language, and he thinks that what we've done in theology is we've used, if you remember your Latin and Greek, we've used a lot of indicative and imperative, which is this is the case and this is what you ought to do about it. And so an awful lot of theology is expressed in those terms, thou shalt not kill, on the third day he rose again, you know, those kinds of statements and, and uh, commands. Um, he's very interested in us asking questions, which I think theologians do. Um, but he said the one thing that we don't do very much is we don't do a huge amount of hoping in public, the optative mood, which is about expressing our hopes of the future. And frankly, we don't do very much in the subjunctive. And if you remember those ghastly days when you were doing this kind of stuff, the subjunctive is when you are not sure about something. You are, the way you are explaining the thing is to, it's a might or a possibly um, and you shift mood because you're not able to say with certainty that this is the case. And he said, actually, if you start shifting the way you behave in these conversations away from, this is definitely it, you should definitely do that, then asking questions and saying, what do you think about this, possibly might this, might be a good way to start. I'd go on further than that, though, because the fantastic think tank, Theos, has come up with a new way of describing what the churches do when they're doing things like food banks and fair trade. And he calls this social liturgy. 
And he says it's different from ordinary, quotes, charity, because when the churches do it, it's very particularised, it's very relational, and it's unconditional. It doesn't stop when the grant stops. It's something that we do because we think it is an important way of strutting our stuff. This is the be the doers of the word, not the hearers who deceive themselves. And actually, when you start thinking of theology as activity, all of a sudden, that square, that empty box, which is what are we doing about our belief in the public square, becomes alive with extraordinary activity. So the church is already brilliant at this. What we need to do is do more of it and scale it up, and we need to be able to explain what we're up to in order to scale and in order to encourage even more people of good faith to join us in that. So if that's the big picture, which is an encouragement that we have the tools theologically, we have the history, we have the heritage, and we already have an awful lot of the structures, how do we individually do that? So I'd like to, at this point, introduce some Disney wisdom for you. Uh, has anyone, would anyone like to admit to having watched The Princess Diaries? <laughs> You're keeping low profiles? Fantastic. Someone at least at the back is being honest. Brilliant movie. Not least because Julie Andrews is fantastic as a queen, of course. Um, so the plot in said movie um, is that there's a teenager in San Francisco who has just discovered she's the heir to <laughs> some kingdom somewhere. And in a typical teenage fashion, first world problems, is deciding whether or not she wants to become, you know, the crown princess. And um, she's having a bit of a trauma in the rain before she's got to go and do a public speech and kind of going, oh, I don't really want to be a queen and all that stuff. And um, luckily her now dead father had had the foresight to write her a letter of instruction for these kinds of moments. And uh, so she takes out this letter from her father and he says, the thing you need to learn is that in life there are some things that are more important than fear. There are some things that are more important than fear. And that was a real light bulb moment for me. I mean, you know, there's lots of other places that say that kind of thing, not least the Gospels. Um, but, you know, <laughs> can't, be a, can't be a bit of Disney to get it to stick in your mind, wearing a tiara. Um, and I think that's the problem. I think the heart of all of this relentless yearning for self-identity and being accepted by other people that capitalism and consumerism key into is about fear. Fear that we're not perfect, that we won't be loved, that we won't be accepted. But there is no room for fear in love. We know that because of our faith. We don't even need to fear death, which is another important reason we know why people consume, because they want to feel somehow more real by covering their lives with stuff, so they sort of feel like they really, really exist. But again, our theology tells us we do not need to fear death. We are already more loved than we could ever understand. So for me, the first step of this is for us all to feel that there are some things in life that are more important than fear and to figure out how we are going to feel braver about taking on this task. Patricia mentioned that um, I wrote a book about leader smithing, which was really trying to recapture the idea of craft for leaders, but also based on some research about how leaders really learn and the kinds of things they need to learn to do leadership effortlessly at a senior level. And leader smithing is to re rediscover this idea of sort of apprenticeship and craft. And one of my um, metaphors in it is about apprentice pieces. So I've brought an apprentice piece along for you to have a look at. I'll pass it around for you to have a play with. Um, it's a very lovely marble font, a miniature marble font. And um, I used to run uh, leadership programmes for the CLAW um, leadership programme, who are lovely people from the heritage sector. So I held this aloft during one of my sessions, going, does anyone know what this is? And some very smart lady in the front row said, yes, that's a Cadworth font, we've got one in our collection, because she <laughs> is the curator of the Oxford Natural History Museum. Um, and it's a very unusual thing. I was given it by um, the rector up in All Saints St Andrews, where I sang um, for my confirmation, actually. And um, there's lots of these all around the world. There's even one in the Andover Chaplaincy Museum because um, it has a lid. They used to take it out to baptise the troops before they went over the top in the First World War. Um, and the reason for that particular font is because there is only one place in the UK that you can find serpentine, which is what it's made of, which is the Lizard Peninsula. And serpentine is a very popular marble because you can work it with tools as well as just with chisels and things. Um, and it's very popular, particularly in Victorian times, so there's a lot of churches that are covered in it. Um, so if you wanted to work that stone, you had to go and apprentice yourself to a stonemason who lived in 
in the Cadworth Peninsula, in the Lizard Peninsula, near uh, in the middle of Cornwall. Um, and when you were ready after your seven years long apprenticeship um, to try and join the Guild, you had to make an apprentice piece as your sort of graduation piece um, to show yourself and your masters and everyone in the Guild that you were ready for the big stuff. And they would go down to the church at Cadworth and they would copy the font in miniature. Um, because there's an enormous big version of that um, in Cadworth. In fact, the rector there has a very small one that he also uses for sort of portable baptisms in, in hospitals and things. Um, so they're a lovely idea that you can do something perfectly in miniature to show yourself that you're kind of job ready for the big stuff. And I think with consumerism, it feels an enormous dragon to slay. How on earth do you take on Amazon? How on earth do you take on these big guns and say, no, no more, we have enough? But actually, all of us can just do little apprentice pieces and we can just start thinking, where do I need to feel a bit more resilient about my behaviour and where can I start leveraging that so that it spreads around like a virus? So I want to say two things before I talk about brass tacks and how you might do that. And one is to explain my theory of change, which is very trendy. You've got to explain that to people so they don't think you're making it all up. Um, and most of you will have come in to find um, a rather suspicious sachet of salt on your chair and might have got excited about chips. Um, but this is because, of course, salt and light. So um, I did quite a lot of research when I was doing my um, Trash and Capitalism book about how systems change. Um, and it's actually very interesting because you might think that how systems change is by massive changes in regulation, massive structural change. But because systems are just human constructions and they're very complex and very, it's the sort of butterfly um, sort of effect, um, you can change systems with nudges quite readily. Um, so there was an experiment done to try and understand about um, human behaviour in, in, a, in a sort of negotiating situation. And those of you who know your game theory might be familiar with a game that they call the prisoner's dilemma. Um, and this they use to try and test gambits and strategies that you might use in negotiating contracts or negotiating world peace or negotiating Brexit, <laughs> any of these things, to try and understand and second guess what the other party might do and therefore what your position should be. So the scenario is you have these two um, prisoners um, who you have arrested for something and you need them both to confess really so that you can get convictions. So you put them in separate cells and let them sweat it out. Uh, meanwhile, these prisoners are sat there and their dilemma is, do I keep quiet and hope he keeps quiet and then if we both keep quiet, no one will get convicted or do I do supergrass really quickly so that I get a better you know, deal and then they go down? And there's that whole kind of dilemma about how do you, you play that? Um, and a very interesting man called Robert Axelrod, who wrote a book called The Evolution of Cooperation, was part of an experiment to try and find out what were the best games, what would be the best strategies in that situation. So they wrote out to a load of philosophers and chess grandmasters and computer scientists and mathematicians and military strategists, anyone they could think of who might have a kind of approach to this and said we want you to submit a game and we're going to play them all off against each other to try and figure out what would be the best strategy in this kind of scenario. And what was interesting is they found that the game that emerged <laughs> victorious was a game called Tit for Tat which was classified as a nice game. So what would happen in the Tit for Tat is the game would be relentlessly nice, they would not betray, they would not let the other people down. But that if they were let down, they would retaliate once and then they'd go back to being nice. So they were quite puzzled by that because we've all read Machiavelli and we assume that the way to get on in life is to screw everyone else and be really sneaky. Um, so they first of all, that was unusual that in a scientific experiment, being nice would be a, a good strategy. So they decided that they would put all these games sort of in a bear pit together in a virtual sort of a way and play them out over time to see what happened to the whole community if you just had them in sharing the community like that. And what they found was you only needed about 10% of the players in that entire community to be pursuing a nice strategy for the whole community to be converted into playing nicely. And they think this is because all the nasty games who were lying, cheating and stealing um, actually ruin the conditions for them themselves to survive and thrive because they ruin the necessary conditions for the community to, to interact in terms of relationships. Um, and they have done these kinds of experiments around evolutionary biology and around a whole load of things. And of course it shouldn't be news to us because we know about salt and light, but it's quite interesting to think about all the other experiments that have been done to say, we don't need to wait until we have critical mass. 
We don't need to wait until the whole world is ready to sort this out. We can actually start being salt and light now, and if we keep it up, we will get places faster than we could ever imagine. We did it before with fair trade. We just seem to have done it with Wonga, haven't we? The church has been really cracking on with that. And there's loads of other ways in which, with the green movement as well, the churches are really leading the way in trying to get people to convert their energy use. There are lots of ways in which we are already doing this and can do it a bit more. So let me talk to you about one particular way you might do that and then send you out with a mini project also on how you might develop that further. Um, so the reason for Trisha's things here is because of the thing I'm going to ask you to think about now. Now, I recognise a couple of familiar faces from where I did a, a talk on God and money here, so you will be familiar with the site of uh, my bank statement. Um, I'd like you to imagine that um, there's been a change of regime uh, at the pearly gates, and uh, St Peter has been on a training course and decided the best way to assess you all uh, is your bank statements. Um, because this is your true and fair account of your economic behaviour, is it not? At least one of them. There may be lots of things that aren't on the bank statement. But as a way of figuring out what you've been up to lately, your bank statements tell quite an interesting story, don't they? Now, how would you feel about showing your bank statement to your spouse? Maybe many of you do that, not all of you, I imagine. How would you feel about showing it to your vicar? How would you feel about showing it to your boss, your best friend? person beside you in this room? How would you feel about that? Because it does seem to be one of these last taboos. We don't really want to talk about how we make choices about money with each other. But actually, if we write about salt and light, and if we write about what we need to do to convert the market, which is just to feed better messages into it, because all the market is is messages about supply and demand, and we change those messages, like we did with fair trade, the market changes to meet us halfway, then all we need to do is be more angelic in our spending. Because if the market was run by angels, we wouldn't have a problem because angels can't sin. So the problem with the market is us. It's not really someone else out there that we need to wait to get you know, more grown up about it. We are the grown ups and we need to fix this. And the way we do it is one transaction at a time. And we have to imagine that every single transaction we make is sending out a message, which is a vote for mammon or a vote for God. So God wants us to try and yearn and find completion in God. So we have that yearning as a vocation from God, but we have rather thought it was a vocation from mammon and started doing an awful lot of spending on stuff to try and uh, be vocational around that. So what I've done is I've done um, a sort of uh, highlighter pens. You could do stickies or whatever you like. Um, but I would challenge you next time your bank statement arrives in your inbox or uh, on your mat, depending on whether you're E or not, um, is to just have a look at it and go through it and try and give yourself some scores so I've given myself an amber on here for my mobile phone bill because um, there's a great website called ethicalconsumer.org that will rank all of these um, outfits, whether it's utilities or um, supermarkets or any provider of anything really in terms of their behaviour around supply chain, around tax behaviour, all those kinds of things. Um, and I think I probably need to move, I think the co-op does a really good mobile phone deal that I need to look into because I don't think they're very ethical. I've given myself some greens for cash. Um, cash can be very good for small businesses because then they don't have to pay banking charges. I've given myself a green for things like Museum of Childhood and the Museum in Edinburgh because it's good to support those kinds of things. Um, I've given myself a green for Jojo Mammon Baby. My uh, brother had a baby at the weekend and uh, they're employee owned, so I approve of them for presents for new babies. I've given myself a red for Sainsbury's because they do have a foundation. Um, which is hugely beneficial, and many of us have been in buildings that they have uh, endowed. Um, but that's kind of moral licensing for some fairly bad behaviour around supply chain. Um, so I'm generally not massively keen on supermarkets, although waitresses have a better record than most on that. I've given myself some greens for local shopping uh, when I was in Berwick. Uh, I took my shopping list down there because um, shopping locally can be a real boost to the economy. Um, on that, I wonder if you've heard about these very interesting statistics about how you can make your money go further. Um, it was the New Economics Foundation who did this experiment to try and find out if you spend your money, is it spent? Where, where does it go? Because, um, of course, it doesn't stop. It normally goes somewhere else. And they want to try and figure out how could you track that pound to find out where it ends up. Um, 
So they called this their blue hands experiment, and they imagined that we'd all been sort of mucking around in messy church and we had paint on our hands. So every time we touched the pound coin in this community, it would get more blue paint on it. And they wanted to find out how blue painty you could keep a coin being before it would sort of end up in a bank or whatever. And they found that if you took your pound and you popped into Sainsbury's or Tesco or something and spent your pound there, then that was it, it was kind of spent, because it would then go straight to HQ or offshore or whatever, um, and it wouldn't do anything else, that would be it. So when they worked out how much that was actually worth to the local community, they worked out it was worth 36p. So your pound sort of diminished in its value if you spent it in a chain, down to 36p that was retained as value locally. What they found was if you spent your pound in like the local florist or the local fishmonger or the local hairdresser or something, the pound travelled and it ended up getting lots of blue paint on it. So if you think about it, you, you give your pound to the lady for a nice carnation um, and she bungs it in her thing that she's got on and then she sort of thinks, oh, I must get a coffee. So she nips into the calf down the road to get a coffee and they take the pound. And then in their lunch hour, they think, I'm just going to get my hair cut. So they nip to the barber's and he gets the pound. And the barber goes, oh, we're out of milk, we're out of milk. So they go to the little shop on the corner to get some milk and you know, that person says, oh, need some stamps. So they pop to the post office, bung it in there. Post office gives it out to pensioner. You know, it goes round and round and round. And what they found was if that pound is kept circulating locally, it becomes worth £1.76. So that's a comparison between 36p and £1.76 in terms of the value to the community of keeping things local. So they now have encouraged, um, I think Northumberland have been really pioneering this, um, some local authorities to source and uh, source uh, supplies and things locally to try and keep blue hands um, all over the spend. So that's an encouragement to you if you are patronising local outfits. In um, Cape Cod they have this lovely initiative where they got you to pledge 50 bucks to one of your, I think you had to pick three that fall when I was there, you had to pick three organisations you didn't want to see fail and you had to go and make sure you spent your money in them. Um, and it's a bit like your local pub, it's the sort of use it or lose it thing. Um, I remember when I was in Chelsea, you'd walk down the King's Road and see that wonderful flower stall. And what would tend to happen is people would look at the flower stall and go, I must nip into Waitrose and get some flowers for Mum. <laughs> and of course they're cheaper in Waitrose, but they're not really cheaper in Waitrose because what happens is the flower stall goes out of business and you lose that. Um, I've given myself some ambers for lazy purchasing like um, M&S Simply Food. M&S are pretty good because of their plan A, um, but that's just laziness, isn't it? Not preparing in advance and sort of being in a pickle. I've given myself lots of greens for charity shopping. That's a great thing if you're a, if you're a nutter like me and you love shopping. Um, then you can just turn it all to altruism by going to charity shops all the time, can't you? Bargain. And if you make dreadful purchases, you just donate them to charity. It's fantastic. So I encourage you to do that. Um, <laughs> um, I've given myself reds for things like Amazon because of their corporate tax behaviour. This is all very complex because, of course, internet shopping is the, the very lifeblood of many remote communities, and it's also keeping the raw mail going. Um, but how you do that as well as you can, um, and not just get into one-click ordering because it's late and you're busy, um, is, is that whole thing about character and what's more important than fear is trying to think, I know it's inconvenient and it will take me longer, but this is too important just to get into my defaults. So you can sort of understand the, the way you would do this, but I would encourage you to try and improve your bank statement. Think about where there are any things that you wouldn't actually be very proud of if you had to go and talk to St Peter about it. And how could you turn those reds to ambers? And how could you just inch those ambers towards green? And it may be that there will always be times when you're too busy and you've just got to rush about doing something that's convenient. But there'll be more opportunities than you thought there were to just take that time to set some systems up so you can think about how do you vote your money for the kingdom so that you're not just spending it and it ends up stopping somewhere or financing something you don't approve of. So that you're thinking of money as your faith, as evidence of your faith and as energy, as a way of supporting things that you approve of and starting to get that going. So the other thing I said that I would leave you with is another mini project apart from your bank statement, uh, which focuses very much on your financial consumerism, to think about how do you get yourself to feel braver and more resilient about not minding if you're the only six-year-old in the playground who doesn't have a poonicorn, um, because we all get those feelings, even if we're not no longer six. Um, so I want to just remind you of a really devastating experiment that some of you may have heard of. Um, which were the Milgram experiments that Stanley Milgram did in the 60s. And for those of you who don't know about these, he wanted to understand why so many good people could have behaved so evilly during the Holocaust. And he wanted to know how we can avoid that happening again. Why, why is it that good people sent people to death camps? So he constructed this experiment where he had sort of teachers and pupils, 
and the uh, teachers were in one set of rooms and the pupils were in another set of rooms. And the teachers were told they had to teach word pairs to the pupils. And if the pupils got the answer wrong, they had to give them an electric shock. Uh, and if they kept getting things wrong, they had to make it a more extreme electric shock each time. And they were told that they needed to be a bit careful because the electric shocks could prove fatal if they went up to the maximum dosage, um, but that that was the, that was the rules for this um, exercise. What they didn't know was that the, the pupils weren't actually um, fellow experimenters, they were actors and had been trained to sort of scream and wail and say please stop and you know, look distressed and things and then eventually to fall silent if they were given what was supposed to be a, a fatal electric shock. Now I'm sure the ethics committee of his university would never have authorised that these days but what happened at the time was they thought how many people do you think might do that? How many people might you know, do electric shocks consistently so far that they might kill someone? And they thought... 1%, that's normal sort of percentage of psychopaths in a, in a community. 65% of those volunteers administered those final fatal electric shocks. 65%. So Stanley Milgram was just devastated. Like Golding, Lord of the Flies, and all these people who've, who've just explained that we're just going to hell in a handcart, he thought that's it. We're just irretrievably sinful and evil. But then along came a very interesting ethicist called Robert Solomon, who said, well, let's look at this a bit more carefully and try and understand what was really going on there. And he said, when you looked at the transcripts and when you looked at the recordings, every single one of those volunteers queried the experiment. And most of them were incredibly uncomfortable and wanted to stop. But they were consistently told by a figure in authority that these were the rules and they had to continue. So from that, he concluded that actually it wasn't that we're evil, it was a failure of warring virtue. And he said, we have a number of virtues that we can exhibit, but some will be more practiced than others. And in those scenarios, people were very used to obeying authority. So it was a sort of virtue muscle that was very limber, very strong, very flexible. They probably weren't used to mercy or civil disobedience or anything like that in quite the same way. And so when there was a war of virtues, the stronger muscle won. And he's used that to revisit the argument, a bit like Alistair McIntyre did in After Virtue, about how committed we've got to all be to virtue ethics and the practices, how we must practice better behaviour daily, because we never know the day we're going to be tested, and we need to make sure as many muscles as we've got are limber and supple. So at the back of my book, I've got a sort of month of virtue, um, which is uh, really a suggestion, and you will all have your own ideas about which virtues you would like to focus on. Um, but it takes virtues like service, creativity, care, commitment, humility, courage, prudence, hope, charity, all the, all the big ones, as well as uh, lots of other ones, and says, well, if you had some cards or post-it notes or something, and you just picked a virtue a day to try and focus on that virtue and just give it a whirl, practicing mercy for a day, practicing humility for a day, what would that be like? And how could you kind of bake that into your routines so that you could kind of check out for yourself which ones felt easy and natural and which ones felt a bit more of an effort? Um, because actually, if we could, instead of going down the gym, go down to our virtue gym every day and make sure that we're entirely comfortable that all our lesser virtues are also exercised, then it will make us better under fire. And it means when we know things, there are things that are more important than fear, we will have the character to be able to see those things off. So I started by talking about the punicorn as a symbol of where we've got ourselves. I then moved on to talk a bit about theology and how we are so beautifully placed to lead the revolution on this, we really must. And that if we can be salt and light, we can create that revolution quite easily and have done so already in the past on many, many different issues. That there are some things that are more important than fear, that we can start with our bank statements, that we also need to think about how we can do a virtue workout and practice lots of different virtues every day, every week, every month, so that we can build up our resilience. And then we'll be able to construct apprentice pieces to practice being stronger around avoiding Amazon for a month or shopping locally for a month or <coughs> giving experiences rather than manufactured items from China as presents, whatever it might be. There will be things to make sure that we feel that we have nailed consumerism because then when we have, we will find it much easier to start challenging other people's behaviour. 
So I wanted to leave some time for questions, um, and I'm very happy just to take any questions you've got, uh, but I thought maybe as a precaution before we do that, I'd give you just a minute to have a bit of a natter or a think with the people beside you, so you can think about what your questions might be, and then I'll do my best to answer them. So just a minute of sort of buzzing with a neighbour about all of that, and about your bank statements if you want to get them out, <laughs> and then I'll come back to you for questions. Okay, I don't want to interrupt you, but I'm going to anyway. <laughs> So that's, uh, Colin Dex would call that formulating your questions, so I hope you've formulated some excellent questions for me. So who would like to go first? Mm. Yes. You started off by telling us um, what your children went and bought with their pocket money. I find it very difficult to interact with my grandchildren you know, do stop them being consumers. You want to be attractive in the way that you spend your, you know, they're, they're spending the money, so that that generation is not going to continue being consumers. Uh, I have no problem with the, you know, bank statement, or I want to know what to do with the grandchildren. Yeah. <laughs> well, so this is a question about what on earth do we do about six-year-olds who are addicted to punicorns, and um, as you can tell, it's a really a very real issue for me. Um, I do have a massive dilemma about it because um, I imagine many of us in this room uh, were bullied at school or weren't rich enough to have cool things at school, and we remember just what that cost us in terms of what happens in the playground. Um, so I don't want to sort of make examples of my children um, in a way that's just going to harm them <laughs> emotionally forever. Um, but I think the heart is understanding what this is about. And I don't think I'd really understood as clearly as I do now that it's about self-identity. And it's about these children feeling loved and accepted in the community. I'm lucky because I've got twins, which means there's two of them. So they are already critical mass in their class because there is a gang of two. So if I can get them to start exhibiting healthy behaviour that make other people jealous of what they've got in a healthy way, then we might be able to start creating a cultural change in that particular primary school. So one thing I'm trying to do is try and figure out what, what is it that attracts them about these things and what would a different way of operating be. So one of the problems is that kids love stuff, um, but actually they talk about experiences. So it may be that migrating kids away from stuff towards experiences so they can come back to the playground and say, this is what I did on the weekend and it was amazing, um, might be one way of generating better quality stories. Um, my, my rubbish default is to buy them the stuff but in charity shops. And unfortunately, if it's their grandparents' money, I have less control over it. But that will go to a charity shop <laughs> for someone else to buy a punicorn for their ghastly six-year-old if they need to. Um, so that I'm not actively contributing to more production of those kinds of things. But of course it is a secondary market and I imagine that's not a very clean way of behaving but at least that money goes to a charity rather than to you know, the manufacturers of these things in the first instance. But I'm, I'm really interested in us having that conversation which is we need to sort ourselves out, absolutely, because we're all worried about what it looks like in terms of our own consumption. But we also need to think much more creatively about what do children pick up, what do they learn, and how can we meet their need for security and self-identity in a different way. So thank you for that question. It's the million dollar question, isn't it? Thank you. Um, thank you very much for some very interesting insights. The man is slightly quoted, but it's all too nice, it's too church of England. Uh, in a sense, I say that respect. Did not the church launch itself by being the awkward squad? By saying to the late Roman, Greek Roman, much of the practice are rubbish, they're wrong, and they also have a strong emphasis on directing their worship towards correct things, like God alone, and not the emperor, burning incense, etc. They were also said the prudes, and well, they were the awkward squad. Would it not really be that? A lot of what goes on in our society is just wrong, stupid, misguided. And the church should actually say that emphatically. We should be more rude, we should be more annoying to get over this. Like Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who begins there by recognizing far ahead of other Germans, the man who's run his country is plain evil. We've got a lot going on in our modern society that is not quite plain evil is getting that way. People should say that, and the churches and bishops should be ready to say that a lot of our society is rubbish and you need to be with it, however much they annoy.
Well, I think perhaps we'd all agree with you on that, my goodness. Um, my lovely introduction opened with something I wrote about in the book, which is that I think the person of the theologian is really important in public theology. Um, because it's terribly easy for a bishop to get up and say, you know, sort this out. And as we found when the archbishops were criticising um, swaps, I think, or something, what was it, um, as well as Wonga, it was found the church commissioners had some investments in things that they shouldn't really have had them in. So trying to be whiter than white is really important before you start throwing rocks. Uh, and I think Jesus found it easier to throw the rocks because it's very hard to get him on anything. <laughs> um, so I guess my concern is that by all means we've got to keep being a thorn in the side and, and more so. Um, and I know that there's an awful lot of thought going on about how do we prime those who lead us who are in the public square to be able to do that more loudly and more frequently and in a way that will be heard. Meanwhile, we've got to stop waiting for that to happen and get our own house in order. And it is very awkward refusing to buy something or asking difficult questions about where was this made and where did the profits go. It's very awkward of the church commissioners to be going to these arm majors and saying, well, if you don't sort out this on the, the transition pathway, we're going to disinvest in you in a couple of years' time. It's very awkward of us to be voting down packages on remuneration because there aren't enough women on boards. There is quite a lot of awkward squad going on economically. But you're right, we need to do more of it. And I'm hoping that this thinking will help us notice where we need to push. Because my theory of change is not about standing back and saying we are without sin. It's about getting stuck in and cracking on and saying the only way we can turn this wheel is by taking charge of the wheel, which is our right. It is our birthright because mammon has stolen this from us and we want it back. Thank you. That's it. Yes, I think you raised a very important issue. My question to you is this now. I think it is generally accepted that the race between socialism and communism and capitalism or social capitalism, and there is no argument about that it is accepted. But don't you think that we should also make a distinction? We cannot just look at capitalism. I say, oh, you have to look at the European capitalism, you have to look at the American capitalism. Oh, I, we can't understand why uh, Trump is trying to throw his banana in the box, but I don't think the Americans should be proud of that. Then you look at Asian capitalism, and in Asia you look at Chinese capitalism. China is an enigma to many of us. Here is a state which is a communist state, but all its practices you look at Africa, they are, they are assembling cars in South Africa, in Rwanda, in, in Ethiopia, etc. But when you look at it, you still follow the, the capitalist rules, so it's no different. And they are not interested in theology. However, corrupt your government is that fair for you to live They are interested in capitalism. Don't you think that we should draw a line? Because the way capitalism is practiced in Europe, it's different from the way it's practiced in China. Never mind what they say. Yes, thank you. So there's a lovely uh, question about types of capitalism and how it differs all around the world and, and which one are we trying to fight and in what way and do we need to be more specific about that. Um, I suppose because of the complexities of there being no pure version of capitalism, if you like, because all the versions out there have got degrees of public intervention um, and you have China at one end of the spectrum because it's within a communist regime but with uh, capitalism within it and then you have theoretically America which is supposed to be the most free market version of it. Um, the book I wrote on toxic assumptions was trying to take all of them back down to their base elements to say they all run on a, on a logic and it's that logic that is flawed regardless of which decisions you make about <coughs> intervention across that spectrum. But also, at a very more simple level, um, all these systems are about a marketplace. However you decide the rules of that marketplace should be set, they're about messages of supply and demand meeting up. So even if you climb a mountain in Nepal, someone will try and sell you something. Um, so there's grey economies, there's official economies, there's, un, you know, there's a whole, whole stuff. It is human instinct if we're good at something or we have access to trade it in order to improve our condition. So if it is all about messages of supply and demand, it's infinitely susceptible to nudging because all we need to do is change those messages. And at the moment, we are holding the system by putting messages in about waitros, about collar stiffeners, about fancy lunches, and I don't know what else it might be. 
the world is not getting enough messages about clean water, about um, antiretroviral drugs, about generics, about all these things. Um, and that was why Tradecraft was so successful, because we started putting in messages by overpaying with that premium that we wanted to encourage that kind of behaviour. And we can replicate that across everything that we do. The idea about the bank statement is that it's about systematically voting for things that we approve of and choosing to give money to particular outfits or charities that we want to, to, to put our energy towards them. Because you're right, we could end up not doing anything because we're not sure what capitalism is anyway and which bit we're trying to fight. Um, but then we'd be lost. And it feels to me that this is too urgent to wait until there's a perfect solution or a right answer. Because if it is that simple about messages for supply and demand, we can all do that and we can do that now. Thank you. This is a question, um, uh, actually a, a comment about just how desperate the challenge is for mental health amongst teenagers because of this and it's something I talk about a lot in the book because it is something which is making this incredibly urgent. I'm the chairman of Gordonston School and we do a lot of thinking about mental health and the effect of social media on that which is why we don't have phones during the working day and while there is uniforms, there's uniforms at my girls' state school as well um, to try and cut down the opportunity for display of that order. Um, but the relentlessness of smartphones and the ubiquity of the messaging makes this just sort of run like it's on amphetamines or something. And it's how do we slow the whole thing down? How do we start with ourselves to take the plank from our own eyes about this, but use those things we've learned to try and educate our children and make them stronger to be able to be um, difficult and um, to be salt and light around things that just aren't right because it is a massive global problem and we know the effect it's having on the planet and we know that half the Wonga loans were for stuff as opposed to just your phone breaking or your car breaking down. Um, so we know it's a real problem and we I think can lead a charge to start showing that there is another way and if we love people enough then they'll know they're accepted by us. And I think, again, that's a challenge the church needs to hear, is maybe we haven't loved people enough for them not to feel they need stuff to be OK. I think we're out of time. I'm very happy to stay on at the end and take questions, yes, by the way, but I know you want to finish promptly. Thank you. You have stimulated us and challenged us, and I trust that you will disturb through us the world, but the spirit starting with disturbing and stirring us too. So thank you. Um, I would love to make sure that you know that our next Sunday forum is on October the 7th with Nassim Nadir, who will be inviting us to think about the radical nature of the peace that Jesus talks about and to explore what this peace truly means. You should have, I hope, received a copy of the leaflet on your booklet, a uh, booklet, a copy of the booklet on your seats. Please do take it away. If you have one already, do give it to someone else who you think might be interested. 
You may already be on the mailing list for the forum. We hope you are, but if you're not and would like to be, please do complete the form and then hand it back to one of us before you leave. We do hope that we will see you again, but before we say goodbye, would you please join me in expressing our deep thanks to Dr. Eve Paul. <laughs> <laughs>